Jesus. <laughs> so many different turns. It was exciting, uh, informational. It got heavy in the right moments. Um, I think it was well performed, well written. Um, I have a lot more thoughts, but that was just my first this, this reaction. Um, I share a lot of what Jen had to say. I had the opportunity to read the play before seeing it, and it was such a different experience, sort of feeling it off the page. And huge kudos to the performers, I think for me, it was very exciting, the physicality of it, and just, I've been thinking a lot about that relationship between sort of embodiment and history, and embodiment as a tool of understanding history. Um, I just finished reading Clint Smith's How the Word is Passed, which is an amazing book about um, cultural heritage and slavery, and how stories are told, but there's a, there's a really embodied quality to that book. So I'm thinking, I was thinking a lot about, about that and just found great pleasure in the movement and the kind of physicality of the actual performance. 
Um, my first thoughts were, wow. <laughs> As I said before, it was just, I've seen so many stages of this play and to um, have read a really early draft of it and then have been in on a conversation um, of, what do I do with this? Um, and then to see what she did with it, it was just, it's amazing. And the problematizing of, of this movement, um, it wasn't easy and it wasn't A and B, you know, it was just all of these many faceted elements that went into where we are today. Um, and I just really appreciate that that was all in there. Mary Beth, I don't know if you want us to explain your, your, your reaction, but I'm sure you've seen this a few times. <laughs> was there any, anything particular that came about actually seeing it in performance and seeing an audience reaction? Yeah, so the play um, is written to have a lot of audience yeah. improvisation yeah. and um, to be truly interactive, and that has been a real challenge because um, those are some of the revisions we had to make to try to keep the actors safe and you safe. Um, and I'm so I was thrilled that you were calling out answers <laughs> and you were happy to vote. Um, so those and sing, you were singing. That was wonderful. Uh, so those, I, I wasn't sure how comfortable we would all be together in a room again. Um, and it is a relief that we're at a place where we have the vaccinations and the masks and we're able to be together again. So that was super exciting to have that experience. Well, thank you. And thank you for writing such a fun play because that audience interaction made it a real, a real treat, I think, for the entire audience. I'm sure you all agree with that. So uh, we worked as a panelist to come up with, uh, all the panelists, and we, we talked about uh, questions that we wanted to discuss here with you tonight. Um, and so I'm gonna dive into some of these questions um, and any of the panelists who wanna speak about it, uh, again, like we discussed, raise your hand. Um, so our first question that we have is, do you feel this performance as an artwork was, an effective, was effective as a tool of education and or activism? So, who wants to take this first? I think we're, oh. I can, I can, I can take that line. Okay. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Sling. Next person. No. Yes, and um, I think for me um, that there, I think of, of art and especially performing art as a collaboration between the artists, the performers, and the viewers. Um, and together we make meaning. And so I think what I appreciated and felt like was really effective in this work was how much was left unresolved for us to continue to sort through as an audience. I bet like after we leave here tonight and keep kind of trying to sort through um, the messiness mm -hmm. that you were talking about and the hard truths of um, white feminism, really. So I, I appreciated that. I appreciated that you didn't wrap things up for us mm -hmm. because I think that means that we're just gonna engage, keep engaging with this work. Um, anyone else? Yeah, um, I agree. I think definitely it was um, effective. I think about what I mean by effective and I think it, does it create change? It's something we can take home with us um, and I think both as an art piece and as a something of education, it absolutely does. Um, it looked at multi-layers of issues that are still current today um, and that were happening then. And it also, um, as an art piece, really like highlighted, um, you know, it highlighted so, so many things. And so I think that, sorry, I just lost my train. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think thinking about also who is, engaging with the material and how many different perspectives that we come from. Um, and it also gave us some actual information and tools to work with as well. So we learned about the history um, of the activism that we can still work on today and made those things. So yes, I think it was actually effective. Good. All right, um, the second question I have here is, the story of the sub, uh, suffrages movement is often told through the lens of white women. How do we best honor the full intersectional history of the movement 
as well as the moments where white supremacy prevailed in the movement. Um, who wants to feel that one first? I can start with that one. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things we talked about as, as the play was developing, is how to add those voices in and how to make sure others weren't occluded or hidden um, in the story. And I, I, no, that's just kudos. <laughs> it was, it's hard work, I know. Because uh, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at all of this in um, the red and, and black and, and white. And one of the things um, is that Mendrick Terrell, Ida B. Wells, that we learned about are members of my sorority. Um, and they founded my sorority in our first public service um, activity. The first thing we did as a sorority was to march in the 1913 march. That's like the best story ever, <laughs> by the way. So, yes. so that, um, as a public service organization, that's what, that's what we were founded on. Um, and so this is, this whole story um, is, has deep meaning for me. Um, and to hear, you know, these amazing women being shown in, in their glory and, and the things that they did, um, not just for black women, but for women, yeah. that it's, it's been really, it's really important. And so I think this play does, does that, bringing out, you know, all, all the women who are part of this movement. So I think that's very important. And another thing, I mean, just kind of as I'm thinking about it, um, for me too, a lot of this isn't known anymore. I feel like a lot of this is lost history. Um, you know, for me, I wasn't really aware that women um, couldn't own land. I mean, I think there's a certain element that's lost of how little rights women actually had. Um, and, and so that kind of knowledge, I think, is really important for people to be aware of. Um, and the play does a great job of teaching you that. Um, for me, there's a really powerful moment early on in the play where um, the, the characters are beginning to have this conversation about kind of what do we include, and I think it's talking about the battle for Kansas, and that moment um, where was, there was this bifurcation of, uh, you know, who, whose votes are we fighting for here, and can we fight for the whole realm of humanity, or are we gonna be make allegedly strategic incremental choices. And I think those kinds of choices, you see them all the time in political movements. We make those kinds of choices a lot in the legislature where I work. And they, they can be really dangerous choices. Um, so I had the opportunity over the last year to study at the Center for Restorative Justice at Vermont Law School and took a really incredible class this past summer on the history of the anti-violence movement that started really in the 60s and 70s, the anti meaning the movement um, that, that feminists started in the United States to create structures to respond to domestic violence and sexual assault in this country. And there was a key strategy early on where folks decided, you know, police aren't responding to these incidents. And so we are gonna kind of embed this movement in policing. Um, and that, that the way that that started was that actually with a lawsuit against a California-based police force who had not been responding. And originally, the basis for the lawsuit was going to be arguing dual discrimination. Discrimination against women and discrimination against black women racism and sexism, and they simplified, they made the choice to simplify and only um, bring the lawsuit forward, argue the lawsuit on the basis of gender. Um, and then there was a lot of pushback from women of color who were like, if, you, if we embed this movement in police and our, the justice system, this can be devastating to communities of color. And guess what, it was, and now, you know, like 40 years later, we're trying to figure out how to undo that. So I thought about that moment as like, these are the moments that grow roots, you know? And then there's like this whole structure that we have to dismantle. So 
but there are also moments of progress, yeah. and it's really hard to argue against progress. So I don't have an answer to that, but those are some <laughs> moments that like really stuck with me and mm -hmm. connected me to that that other moment in his American history, more recent American history. And so, uh, Mary Beth, do you want to touch anything on uh, writing the play and, and trying to get the inner? Sectionality. Yeah. And do it. It sounds like you two worked a little bit on oh, this. Yeah, because yeah. really you did like a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the I was telling. Um, sorry, Catherine or Kathy? Okay, Catherine. Thank you. Just make sure because we have a Kathy and yeah. a Cass. So. And they're still the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the I was uh, I was saying that the pandemic hit and we were really sad that we couldn't do the show last fall, but. Um, the Suffrage Centennial Alliance um, uh, spoke with us and said, we're, we're still behind this play and, and we want you to keep working on it. And um, I said, well, now that I have the gift of some time at home doing nothing, um, <laughs> I really would like to dig more deeply into um, this, this racial tension and the most wonderful thing the Alliance did was to say, we would like to pay for you to have some readers because you know there's a lot of a lot of folks in the arts do this work as a labor of love, but we need to take the time and recognize expertise and women of color who are willing to do the work, um, and we need to acknowledge that and financially, not just um, out of the goodness of your heart, which is wonderful. But I, and that was just this really wonderful moment of, of respect. And what a gift to me as a writer to be able to um, access um, women who were, were not shy about telling me how, where I was landing on this draft. And it, was, it was a really rich conversation. Of, you know, there are lots of moments like the, the hat, like the hat as a white person, like, oh, suffrage hats are fun. And then there's this conversation, I'm like, oh no, suffrage hats mean something very different for women of color. And that was just an angle I didn't have. Like that hasn't been my experience and I, I had to, oh, that's really helpful. And so just little nuggets like that. And then as part of the larger conversation, um, you know, we, we were really excited to maybe have an actor of color. But then after this conversation, it, there's education. We wanted it to be educational, but we didn't want a person of color on the stage having to educate us. Yep. Because we, as white women, need to do the work, mm -hmm. and and so we had a lot, and that was that was an awkward conversation. Both uh, uh, Laura and I went uh, for hours. Um, we love actors of color, and we and we can solve the problem. Vermont is very white, and there is a small pool of actors, but we could figure it out. We're creative, but ultimately, um, Laura's like we said, we 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 don't want that person to be in that role. And um, even though um, our readers were like, it's okay for you as a white lady to write black parts because it's not just a black, you know, that's fine. But we realized that we wanted, we wanted the play to reflect the work that white people need to do, what they need, should have done historically and what they need to do now to, to be better. Um, and so that was a, a real choice we made from out of that conversation. And I think that struggle, like, um, and, uh, Kathy Bloom really was helpful in that, you know, she had to really dig into the, yep. that, that tension, and then it became a, you know, a multi-generational thing of what can people who are younger, how do they push us who are in our middle age and older to do better? Um, and so that was, it was so exciting, and I just am so thankful that the Centennial Alliance, and Bizarrely thankful for the pandemic. <laughs> uh, uh, because I think it is yes, a better right. play for that time and that opportunity and um, uh, and really thought, like I having a little distance from the all of the tension having distance. They're still happening. Uh, the tensions, the racial tensions, but being able to see it a little bit more clearly um, and trying to reflect that in the piece. So I'm I'm glad that you're seeing that intersectionality because it was it was a lot of work uh, from, and again, playwriting is collaborative. Uh, and so I'm so thrilled to have been able to have partners to, to reach that place. Well, I thought it was great how you used sort of the generational conflict. 
as like the sort of stream for the viewership to get that information and have the emotional content with it. Um, and it was very real. I think there's kitchen table dialogue that happens across America, like Thanksgiving, you know, those types of moments and families. And I thought you really did a great job writing for that. So that was wonderful. Well, thank you. All the actors are like, oh, it's so stressful. We <laughs> have to take, to take breaks because you do feel it. It's, that feels real. It was, it was wonderful. And, and that kind of leads into our next question, um, which I think I'm going to actually break this up. It's actually, we did the giant question with like three questions. So I'm going to break this up, and I think it's this one's more prevalent for what we were just discussing, is what audiences will feel included, and who might feel excluded from this story? Um, is the next question. Let's go first. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, I love that question. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a difficult question because yeah. it's um, it, it's intentionally trying to be inclusive, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's mentioned in the play that you can't be all things to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there are, um, it, it, it's the view, the lens is the lens of a white woman. Yeah. And that's okay. Uh, but in, in, with that lens, you also have to understand how um, other women are going to, to feel the play. Um, I was just excited when I heard, you know, my, my sore was in there and, you know, other, other, other black women that are really, that I've always known about. And I'm like, oh, good, you got that one. <laughs> um, and then having the indigenous women and, and Asian women in there, and then I was like, I saw the visual aid. I saw your question, and I'm like, oh, I know who I left out. I left out Adelina Otero Warren. And so I was like, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> She's amazing. From New Mexico. Well, I left out all the New Mexican um, Latina um, suffragists. They're incredible. So. Yeah, I know. That was, it was, I was, um, Sarah Mel tells me, you're a little bit Tory. Let me read you this book. So I, I did leave them out. And that hurt. I only got Helen Keller in by the skin of my teeth. Um, it was, yeah, it was hard. And, and um, Kathy Bloom says, you should write more. No, you should. Yeah. 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 I'm not a playing card. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I and, and, and I'm just gonna quickly. I, for me, I found it fascinating to think that um, you know colonialists coming from Europe and seeing tribes, indigenous tribes in America. That you brought that up. That there were women in positions of power who elected the elders. And, you know, I mean, after, you know, you go back to Rome, Greece, where women were always sort of in this very second tier class. And so how, in, I mean, it's such an interesting way to think about that, that by coming to America, you were, saw a culture where women were empowered. And, and you'd been in this culture where that was never really the case. And that was very, it was very enlightening for me, actually. And I never thought about it like that, but it makes sense. But, and to be fair, not all indigenous, no. um, tribes were, were in that position. The Abenaki, for instance, are not, for ex example, are not matrilineal. Um, but the Haudenosaunee were, Haudenosaunee were huge and a, very, a political power um, that many suffragist women were looking at and learning from and taking inspiration from, though not always giving the credit for. Mm -hmm. I just want to add something to that. Yeah. I was thinking about the point that um, Catherine, you were making, um, that this is the voice of a, a white woman. Yeah. And one of the important things about art is that it not only like represents culture but can also make culture and that what people have looked for and what people are looking for um, and ask about who would feel included or not included is feeling when art is representative and so if you feel yourself represented in a piece of art then you're going to feel included and if you don't and I think you did a great job of naming and including and I can imagine if somebody didn't feel included how stark that would feel um, so, and I can see how detail that you tried to get everybody in there. But just under, I think when we think about art and the importance of that, um, and the idea of representation uh, is super important. Mm -hmm. I think where I am, Laura is talking with me already about 
okay, what might another draft be? I think what I would let go would be a little bit of the Vermont suffragist um, in order to bring in, um, in particular, the Latina suffragist, because that's just so large, and Vermont is small. <laughs> um, but for us, it felt really exciting to tell that story, but I think to another draft, that would be maybe something. <laughs> as a, as a, I also love that as a, as an educator and thinking about things that are place-based, like that actually grounded mm -hmm. all of us in the yeah. march to, like, yeah. I have to say the march to the, to the Montpelier to the Capitol, and in the rain, and thinking about today that everybody was in the rain mm -hmm. in right. Montpelier, and like that was so well done, and Absolutely. so grounding it in Vermont is actually really important. I would not cut that, I would add 10 minutes oh, to play. Ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and this leads us great, this is a great lead into our last and final <laughs> panel discussion. Um, what parallels in the play do we see today? <laughs> Who wants to go first on that one? I've got first already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Are you okay? uh, sure. I, I mean, I think Governor Kunin, you know, was very direct in talking about the, the battle for bodily autonomy that's happening, that's incredibly gender-based right now. And as Jen was alluding to, there were marches all around the country in defense of reproductive rights today. Today, um, and yeah, it's a real. It's it's just the. I mean, it's it's been ongoing, right, since Roe v. Wade made abortion legal. Um, and I, one of the things I didn't tell you about you in my introduction is that I, I co-founded something called Vermont Access to Reproductive Freedom, which is a fund that helps yes. 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 otherwise afford it. And like this is not new. I think is a really important thing to think about. So you know, in a very short period of time after Roe v. Wade was legalized, the Hyde Amendment was introduced, which is a annual budget amendment that means that federal dollars can't be used to pay for abortion despite it being a safe, legal medical procedure, which meant, means that states have to supplement um, if they want their Medicaid dollars to be able to use, be used for abortions. And most states, many states don't. Vermont does, but many states don't. So even immediately after abortion was legal, it was still inaccessible to so many women who, or people um, who didn't have access to medical insurance. And there's always been this huge stark divide. And so what we're seeing now in the landscape where that divide is just gonna grow and grow and grow. But I, I wanna say to you that I think Vermont has a really important role to play in the future of access to reproductive rights because we're one of the states with the least restrictions. We just did a statutory, um, we just amended our, our state law to affirm the right to abortion a few years ago and we're about to amend our, change our constitution um, and you'll get to vote on that in November. Um, Assuming it has its legislation. So, you know, like right after the Texas law, there was already women coming to Planned Parenthood in Vermont to get abortions, and, and that's that's gonna continue to be the case. So we have a we have a big role to play in this state in this battle as long as we can continue to affirm and uphold the uh, degree of rights to reproductive freedom that we have. I think another parallel is the, the right to vote. <laughs> 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 yeah. like, um, it, is, it was never fully won, um, and, it, and it is being eroded even more um, again. Um, so uh, women of color, people of color were always kind of even with the ratification of the vote for, for men and then for universal suffrage, it was not universal. Um, and now it's being eroded again, and we're, we're fighting many of the same battles with many of the same stuff, drama that was going on on the stage, with some of that same drama is going on again. Um, so that's, that's a stark parallel. So steal yourself for the ongoing fight. <laughs> <laughs> it's and not yeah, actually access to voting <laughs> rights or lack of access to voting rights and 
redlining and gerrymandering is a, is a like direct tool of the anti-choice movement too. Yeah. That's how they're able to pass these super restrictive laws in places where the majority of people actually support access to abortion. So there's a direct connection. Yep. No, always have, there's always the same story, yeah. different date. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can get anything out of it. Um, anybody else want to? I, yeah, I will. yeah, in addition, I thought both of those things were really stark for me. And I think also the differences, going back to the conversation around the racial tension, that's still very present today. Um, and it happened, in, and on the generational differences, and I think that um, while a lot of progress has been made and we're able to have these conversations and have them more openly, um, that in a lot of the organizing communities, this is still a real issue as far as who gets access and who gets voice. Um, it's a continuing to shine light and, and truth into those places is going to be really important. Yeah, and another uh, quick thought too is I think it's also uh, socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, people with means, certain laws don't affect them as much. Uh, people who have to work, you know, two jobs, might be single moms who can't get to vote because there's no voting now on Sundays. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of those things, you know, it's very easy to set the bar to uh, preclude access, mm -hmm. whether it's to abortion or voting. It's, it's definitely being utilized today, um, unfortunately. So those are the ends of our questions. Now we are open to your questions. Anyone have any questions for the panel? <laughs> I've never asked you this, Mary Beth, oh. um, but what? Were you inspired by any dining room table conversations? <laughs> In perhaps in the intergenerational conflict between <laughs> 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 Julian, you know my mom is in the front row. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think he said, well, yeah, she was great. She also was a eugenicist. And I went, she was what? I didn't like her. She would support her. And I was like, well, Julia, that's the theme of the play. <laughs> she actually probably would. And also, she would still acknowledge that she did wonderful things. And I said, well, that's really hard. <laughs> that's work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, right. Yeah, you got me. Um, yes. Uh, through a, an unusual circumstance, I became very interested in the women's suffrage movement in uh, 2011 and read about it for about 10 years, nine years. Anyway, and, and became familiar with many, by reading biographies, many of these women. And the, the, what I learned is the story, um, the umbrella story of suffrage, is so interesting. There's so many amazing women and men who are involved. And I was very excited to come here tonight, and I appreciate what you did very much. My question to you is, given the richness of the umbrella story, how did you ever choose which people to include? I just wanted to say this was a, a wonderful piece of, of very uh, entertaining and powerful theater, live theater that we saw. And, and you literally broke the fourth wall so many times. And it was, it was your actors were, were amazingly uh, just so present. And um, I kind of felt like I kept on going back and forth through time. I kept on being reminded that it was 2021 but also going back and the blocking and the timing, I, this was like, I, this, this looked like it was the 15th performance, not the first, and yeah. I just yeah. think it's great. I concur with him, but, <laughs> but I also want to say, um, you know, one other struggle that doesn't get recognized as often uh, in the whole women's suffrage movement is that women who were for peace, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, women who were fighting for peace kind of got pushed to the side too. They were sacrificed in all the compromises. And so you don't hear about those women because you know what I was taught in school was that the reason women got the vote was because of all the work they did for you know for World War One and blah blah blah, and that was really pushed at that time. The idea of patriotism and supporting it, and somehow to be a woman for peace against war, like Jeanette Rankin yeah. and some of the others, was one of you know was considered bad. So they too were pushed to the side. The whole peace movement and women's involvement in that was pushed to the side. Oh, another American theme. Right. <laughs> 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 Prevalent. 
Hi. Um, wonderful job. It was really great. Thank you so much. And, oh, so great to be back in the theater. Um, yay. <laughs> I would, I'd like to um, just also comment that activism is really hard. And I think you really reflected that. You know, you did it in a, in a few subtle ways, like talking about having to leave your kids at home. And then, of course, that grueling scene with the force feeding. But I think it's a really important message because anyone that's doing any activism today, it's just not fun. You know, it's a, it's a long, tedious fight. And I appreciated that you picked up on that. Um, and I will also, Margaret, I'll echo on the, the peace movement. And as also, there were one of the population you might want to just even throw a nod to are the Jewish women that were fighting really hard at the early part of the century. And, and going along with the, the war movement, there were Yiddish anarchists who weren't working on the feminist, uh, they were working on feminism, but not the suffrage movement. So you know, it just might show up somewhere in there on the next draft. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. I want to hear from Laura. <laughs> Just because you seem, I know you have so much to do with all of this, especially with the design and, and the staging and everything. Mm -hmm. So what were your ups and your downs and your thrills in this whole process? Um, well, first thrill was that we were going to <laughs> yeah, um, knowing that we were going to have this project to come back to when the pandemic would allow us to was a uh, 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 nice beacon, I think, for us and for the actors as well. Something that Mary Beth has underplayed a little bit is the number of readings we actually did of this work. Uh, there were this uh, play, and also our, our company, Complications Company, is uh, we're a we are devoted to complications in the new work, but it's a specific ram uh, reference to dramaturgy that both Mary Beth and I are deeply committed to uh, creating a process-based dramaturgy that focuses on the project itself, and that means developing a system that will best serve the play in, 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 in uh, whatever the play happens to be. And this play, because it was so much a story of so many women, and we knew that we needed to take it to some places that might get dark, and we wanted to make sure that we were as inclusive as we could be in one hour, uh, that uh, we ended up having a number of, of, of public readings uh, at different stages of the script, and sometimes they were public readings with actors, and sometimes they were, were reading panels where we had panels to, to read and to reflect on, uh, and Zooms, oh my gosh. Uh, but that process, uh, I think, it definitely showed up on stage today, that we saw the, the script, we were able to bring the script to a place um, that Mary Beth was really, could really tell the story that was in her heart and not just the one that was in her brain. <laughs> and uh, that was really exciting to see. Uh, for me personally, uh, my life went upside down when I realized that um, I wasn't going to be able to pull my costumes out of a trunk from the corner, but if I wanted to honor these women's stories, that meant we had to go and get really detailed with costumes, and uh, and so yeah, so I've been buried by the sewing machine for a few months, <laughs> trying to get everything to give them the right look because that was part of it too, uh, that the suffragists and part of the suffrage movement was uh, the type of visuals that they created. They created these banners, these, uh, these big banners that the Silent Sentinels had in front of the White House are really iconic. And uh, to uh, the, the idea of, of having the big signs of the protests and, and all of these things, some of the, the visuals that we have from those era, the, that era, the era, the, the early, early 20th century era, are truly remarkable. And so trying to figure out how we would incorporate those into the, into our, the visuals of our, our work was a lot of fun, and, uh, but also a lot of work. And trying to uh, find a way to create a sort of 
this in-between world that our actors could belong and could, could bring to audiences all around Vermont that was open and engaging and interesting and visually pleasing, but also had strong roots and reflection in the actual movement itself. And so that was a, a tremendous amount of fun. But the best part, I think, of all, and Mary Beth, I know, will agree with me, was when we landed our Dreamcast. That was a, a big, big deal for us. Uh, we had, I, and I want to also thank all the tremendous actors who helped us along the way, because we had so many different readers come and join us on Zoom and in real life for the past three years, or three years? Yeah, three years we've been working on this piece. And uh, we've heard a lot of fantastic Vermont, write, Vermont women read these roles, um, and not in an audition perspective, but really just there to, to let us hear these words in different people's mouths and to understand what that might mean and how that changes the story and, and all of those things. And uh, that was really terrific. But as, as especially in the, in the final, when we were getting down to the final wire, once we sort of had uh, figured out and Mary Beth had really like, you know, found it, had really found this story, then we, we knew we needed to have the right folks for this. And I, I, I couldn't be happier with the three, that, uh, three fantastic performers who agreed to join us for this uh, crazy little trip. And our amazing stage manager, Caitlin, <laughs> who has to, he has to know exactly what order those cards have to be in. Oh my God, those cards. Uh, yes, my, I love the cards. The cards were my excuse to buy myself a nice copy of, uh, of Adobe full creative suite. So that was, that was uh, I was happy that I got to do that and I had an excuse, so. But yes, yeah, so maybe Caitlin has to know how to, which order those cards have to be in for every single show. And honestly, I know I can't do it. So I hand my hat, hat off at all times. That's all I want to say, except I love to every show. Sorry, I want to jump in on that one, sorry, because I do have an anecdote from something that happened in one of my, uh, I, I, I'm an adjunct at uh, Northern, uh, Northern Vermont University, Johnson, uh, where I teach in the performing arts. And I'm currently working on a project called Unburn Me about uh, Joan of Arc, which it's a devised work that's being done about Joan of Arc there with the, with the students. And uh, while we were working, I had a group of students who were working on different, in different areas now, this group, part of their pandemic thing last year, when they, had, they did their devised work, they, um, uh, Isaac was directing the, Isaac, Isaac uh, was directing the, the show, he's the, the head, of, head of the department there, and he thought it would be fun, because of the, the centennial, to do a play that was themed about the suffrage. He thought that, that would be a terrific, act, terrific topic for the students to dive into. And since he knew that Mary Beth and I were working on this project, he invited us to come and uh, over Zoom to let the students read an earlier draft of the play, the draft that we were currently on, and that we would then talk to them and, and do some dramaturgical work about like how plays, how, to, how you build plays. And uh, so, the, so anyway, so all the students there, and a few of my students actually came tonight to see the show, which was great. So they saw an earlier draft of this. But when I went to my rehearsal, it was about two weeks ago now, and there was two young men who were there, and I had, they were working on an exercise for this Joan of Arc play that we're working on, but it, it's sort of like they'd done, they finished the exercise and they were waiting for everyone else to catch up to them. And I, I caught an, uh, an ear, something I heard, and, and, and I heard Harry burn. And I'm like, what? Okay, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, oh, we were, we were just talking about suffragists and, and like how cool it was that like this Harry Burns guy in Tennessee, that like this like, like little Republican boy from like nowhere would like be the person that passed it. Yeah. And the idea that these two theater students in northern Vermont would be there chatting <laughs> about suffrage 
um, made me think that I made me feel really great about the exactly that the power that that these these art things can can have can reach much much further than we ever think they will. So anyway, I wanted to have that.